Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You won't see the show on your TV So we talk about things musically Cause you're listening to Jams and Tea You're listening to Jams and Tea Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea, and today we are going to be covering Morgan's recommended album. We were going to be covering this a few weeks ago, but, you know, shit be weird, and uh, mm. now we are here to cover it, and that is the self-titled Third Eye Blind. Morgan, why don't you tell us a bit about why you picked this album for us to discuss and who Third Eye Blind are? So, Third Eye Blind are a band with one, and only one album, uh, their <laughs> self-titled <laughs> debut album. <laughs> Um, it's like Jeff Buckley, man. Like, oh. Yeah, it's tragic. Yeah. What it, it could have been so much more. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is, this is a record from 1997, most notable for uh, singles like uh, Jumper and Losing a Whole Year, but most namely uh, the ubiquitous uh, uh, all-star level hit uh, Semi-Charmed Life. Um and I think part of the reason I wanted to pick this record is because it's 14 songs and most people know one or two max from it. And like, they're all good. So um, many, many of them are great. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah, I don't think we're going to have any dissenting opinions here today. To this album kicks mm, ass. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like the first seven tracks are like a 10 a 10 a 10 another 10 oh, and a 10 after thank, that thank god that the implication of the first seven tracks being the thing means that nobody's gonna hop on my ass for my least favorite track so good well i wouldn't rule that out it's, it's not bad um, it's just we'll get to that yes okay um Thanks. so yeah who wants to who wants um, to jump right in i mean i i i can go if you want yeah. Okay. Why not? All right. So um, this was my first experience with the Third Eye Blind. The only thing I knew about them going into it is uh, that they could uh, be, after listening to the album, arguably be called sort of post grunge, but they have a lot more on this record um, after listening to it. Uh, losing a Whole Year is quite a way to open the record um, with that haunting sort of guitar opening on those sort of clear guitars um and it blends that sort of like post grunge thing with like power pop and some like emo tinges as well and i just loved it um yeah um and there's the uh couplet in it you thought you found your place with pierced queer teens in cyberspace um which just made me so happy because he saw my future um, I was gonna say fucking <laughs> serious. That's what the podcast is, really, isn't it? I can't. Um, I can't. Pierced queer teens in cyberspace. Can't wait to crack open how lyrically brilliant this album is from front it's to back. It's so, it's so good. No, it's so no, well written. Uh, and the opening track is a great example of it. Really encapsulates the way it brings together this like, like pop flow and really hooky lyrics um, with a sense of real, actual, like emotional sincerity. Um, and often quite like heavy uh, riffs um, with a lot of sort of nice meat on them. Um, narcolepsy, track two, like Morgan said, it's a 10 and it's a 10 and it's a 10 and it's a 10. Um, this one has uh, a much sort of like more moody atmosphere, heavy guitars and it's, um, yeah. I, I can't read my handwriting now, but I think it said, how would you like to be down and drowning or something like that? And it just really struck me. Um, and again, my notes are semi-charmed life, as Morgan has alluded to, like Smash Mouth, but better. Um, it, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just this immaculate pop song um, that just brings the hooks, both in the guitars and the vocals. Um, and it's just so much fun to listen to. Um, and then you go into Jumper, which is a real contrast because it opens with an acoustic guitar and this guy singing, I wish you'd step back from that ledge, my friend. Um, and it's like, oh, we're listening to this kind of song now. Um, yeah, it's, everyone's got a face up. This kind doing. of album now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. T TBH. Um, but even with these very emotional lyrics, it's still quite like a nice and breezy song. It's just very poignant. Um, and we're sort of beginning to see 
a structure that they're going to use again and again, which is opening quite soft and acoustic and then building and building and building up to this sort of big uh, uh, electric guitar, very fuzzy finish that's a real emotional climax, which they will do several times on this record. Um, I care slightly less for graduate, but I feel like that's a contextual thing. If I listened to this record before I graduated, I probably would think the song was written for me. Um, but just has less relevance to my life now, I suppose. Um, but I think it's a great... Okay, but, it, uh, but have you considered have you considered that it fucking slaps? It does. <laughs> I was about to say something basic. Can I catch Like, it's just was, so hard. I was about to say that it's still a really, really hard and amazingly written song. Um, I can't hate on it that much. Um, I just don't resonate with the lyrics so much. But there are hooks in here that stay in my head for days. And again, when he shouts, can I graduate? It is really cathartic and very satisfying. Um, yeah, how it's going to be. It's a really lovely ballad that I love. Thanks a lot. Um, feels like kind of like bruising, but then when the chorus comes in, it's so crisp and melodic and joyous. And the way his vocals tilt down, it goes, thanks a lot. Just hits me in my, in, in my like feelings. Um, and it, it just captures this wonderful sense of melancholy through, through strong melody and driving guitars that this kind of music does at its best. Um, yeah, um, and again, we're getting towards the back half of the record now. Only a modicum of a drop in quality, uh, but not much because they're all still great. I, there's not a song here I don't like. Um, Burning Man, I love that song. Good for you. I love that song. It's got a blistering intro riff. Um, is it good for you? Is it good for you? Just, mm. again, London, I, I feel like I just, I can't quite get a grasp on the sort of emotional narrative but it's still a very satisfying song instrumentally um and i feel like if i was to listen to it more i would i would get a grip on it but i've listened to it several times now and, and i haven't but there is evidently something there that is resonating with people i want to give it credit for that um yeah um i want you is this uh, is this ballad where different vocal lines and ideas begin to sort of overlap and build this really strong atmosphere um, uh, and I, I love the, the way he says, uh, send me all your vampires. It, it chills me. Um, yeah. Uh, the background, another lovely ballad that does do that building and building and building thing. Um, I felt you long after we were through. That's just one example of all of the heartbreaking lines in this song. Ow. If you want, if you, if, exactly. If you want heartbreaking lines though, we, we have the next song, Motorcycle Drive-By. <sighs> Ah, God. Urgh. Why didn't you all fucking warn me? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. God. There's this burning like there's always been. I've never been so alone, and I've never been so alive. Because if I, if, if I warned you, you would have braced. And if you brace, <laughs> then you're putting up your walls. And it's... Yeah. It's, yeah. It feels... um. I feel slightly bad for the song God of Wine because it's one of the best songs on the album, but it has to follow up my favorite song on the album. And it's trying to close out the record in a way I would happily have had it closed with Motorcycle Drive-By. And it's just, it's a great song that suffers by comparison to the only song it's next to on the record. Bullshit, um, it's a great song. I disagree. Sorry. I, did, I, said, I said it was one of the best songs she on said, the album. Yeah, I was gonna say she said it was great. It doesn't suffer from anything. It's great on its own. <laughs> Kill myself. I was having an episode. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, guys. Yeah. Sorry, it's not you. It's, like, it's, it's not num- you, Sergio. Num- I'm just really... like number number one. How dare you? You come into my home on the day of my daughter's <laughs> wedding. It's not even you, Sergio. I'm just really kind of like thinking about this album now, and it's it's just getting to me. <laughs> it does that. It does that. Really. Oh. Um. The way that it builds and the chorus soars so beautifully. Um, I, I think I find about this album the most strongly is that there's a lot of like pop punk records from the mid 2000s, uh, sort of 2006 and 2008. It meant a lot to me when I was younger. And this is like evidently inspirational to everything that was happening at that, in that scene, but it's so much better. 
and I'm just like, if I'd have had this in my life when I was that age, I would have just wound up having good taste much earlier. And if only, uh, because this, I would have loved this, if anything more than I do now, and I love it a lot now, what is sort of, when I was listening to records like sort of Take Off Your Colors or Lesson in Romantics, which now I look back and seem awfully twee, but this doesn't, this holds up so amazingly. Um, and it's because there's just much better craftsmanship behind it. Um, and I love it. There's also like a sense of maturity on this record as well. That, um, and that's not to, not to denigrate a lot of pop punk records because um, a lot of their strength and appeal comes from a sense of raw youth driven angst and stuff but this is a record that feels like it's made you know you, you're, you're a little bit older than you were when you were like going through all that angst and mm. and and you're like just more aware of how the world works and it just makes everything all the shit of, of it hurt more because like you understand it all better than you did when you were 17 and you feel like even more powerless in some ways because you just feel yeah. like you lack the, the you might have had a, a bright-eyed sense of, of of confidence that you could you could you know fix shit and now you're just like 24 or whatever and you just can't fix anything um I feel that tyler it's yeah. amazing that you say that because my thesis statement for this entire album that i just wanted to lead with was this album is what it sounds like to be 19 it's like you've been an adult for one year, an adult for one year, and you're definitely wiser than you were when you weren't an adult. And you're just like, there's, there's still like, there's still like an immaturity here that I think is like really strong, but it's also, it's like, it, it rides a middle ground really, really beautifully. And I think that's sort of where the, uh, the charm <laughs> Uh, the charm of this album kind of lies is that it's like it's occupying the best of both worlds for so many good things like it's got this really really just Im immediately satisfying like grungy kind of rock sound it reminded me a lot of the first smashing pumpkins album gish uh in some places just like the like the guitar work on this album is fucking terrific and may i say uh, i looked up who the guitarist was a uh, man by the name of stefan jenkins uh, he has never done anything notable other than be the guitarist for Third Eye Blind, and uh, he's the, the vocalist. Was... Other, okay, yeah, uh, but he uh, is also when I Google his name, the first thing under his Wikipedia article is a consequent of sound article of the Jimmy Eat World drummer calling him a creepy fucking douchebag. Yeah, <laughs> so, yes. um, he's... <laughs> this is this is like the my beautiful dark twisted fantasy of alt rock. It's, can, it can only be written by a completely scummy asshole. And yep. like that's where it, you, you just really sort of latch on to it. But yeah, the like, guitarist yeah. that you were thinking of is a man by the name of Kevin Cadigan, who oh, uh, sued Jenkins and the rest of the band because, for, uh, I think, a wrongful termination it was. Either that or he... And it, definitely part of it was that he was not... Uh, getting his uh, his dues uh, monetarily from the songs that he wrote on this album. Um, yeah, he's putting in work. Yeah, um, uh, he, yeah, he was fired after this first album, at some point. Hmm. Um, so this is the only Third Eye Blind album. I think that that makes a lot of things make a whole lot of sense and yeah, does, really. just to make this as brisk as possible i'm the only uh, i'm the other person that like like tyler and morgan were familiar with this album i like Sersha was not um i had only heard semi-charmed life because you know it's like it was on the radio and you know i was alive in the 2000s so of course i heard it um but it's really funny to me like you all sort of prepped me in a sense of just like you know if you're expecting uh, an album of songs that sound like semi-charmed life don't it's not like yeah. that, and it's really weird to just hear that coming after two songs as masterfully written as Losing a Whole Year in Narcolepsy. And I'm not knocking Semi-Charmed Life, by the way. I think that's a great song. Just I, I still think it's like fun, and it sort of captures that youthful sort of energy here that's sort of like 
I mean, it's basically just a song about fucking doing drugs not to feel anything. And that's, like, the only, this being the only, like, like legitimate bright spot on the album, like, thematically really, really works in its favor. And just the, the energy is maintained um, so, so fucking well. It's, like, it, it's just such a great, immediately satisfying record that yields so many dividends when a lot of albums like this can just fall apart on re-listen. Uh, and they don't. And, uh... I'm sure Morgan's going to do it better than me, but I wanted to point out some examples of, of songs that, um, let me just say I, I was, I was not a, prepared to be this emotional in this Wendy's tonight, uh, when I heard these, um, uh, the, the opening lines to the fucking album, just on losing a whole year, are, losing a whole year, losing a whole year, I remember you and me used to spend the whole goddamn day in bed, losing a whole year, hiding in your room we'd lay like dogs, and a phone would ring, like a joke that's left unsaid, losing a whole year. Rich daddy left you with a parachute, your voice sounds like money and your face is cute, but your daddy left you with no love, you touch everything with a velvet glove. And I'm just like, what in the hell is going on? Like, this is too good, like, this has to be like where the album peaks, right? And it's like, no, it's, it's actually not. And then yeah. you get fucking narcolepsy, which is like just as fucking painful and then it just goes straight into do 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 like it's jarring but like in a way i kind of appreciate i, I it sort of like lifts the record up just a tiny bit uh then there's um Sarah did speak to one of my favorite lyrics on motorcycle drive by which is one of the the greatest penultimate tracks i think i've ever heard i mean god damn uh but uh li listening to that song man fucking it 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 like, visions of you on a motorcycle drive-by, the cigarette ash flies in your eyes, and you don't mind, you smile, and say the world doesn't fit with you. And I'm just like, this is just capturing me at my most quintessentially teenage, and it makes me feel a lot of different things. It makes me feel, like, bittersweet. It makes me fondly recall nostalgic things. And, like, and when I listen to music that was a little bit more like this, that wasn't nearly as good... Um, but it's it's just so nostalgic. It's a fucking time capsule, but in a way that is timeless, and that's why I think it's a fucking excellent album. But the song that stands out to me the most that I think is my favorite on the album uh, is Thanks A Lot, uh, which... Okay. <laughs> fucking, uh... All hands on deck, boys, because the ship was made to sink. Your swabber salutes you now, but I think... Our, but I know what he's thinking. I woke you up and I slit the throat of your confidence. And then there's, you don't even know, thanks a lot, the clothes she wears misfit, and she's nervous when she speaks. Her zombie mom and dad live in a separate house of freaks. I woke you up and slit the throat of your confidence. This, this song breaks my fucking heart. This is, like, it, it is, it hurts me <laughs> to, like, listen to, but it's also a bop. And I'm like, I don't understand how this band can keep continuously doing this. Like, maybe this is the only Third Eye Blind album in a sense, because it's like, I, I don't feel like a band that is this consistently talented and good at, like, hitting this particular note this well and this resonantly could fall off so quickly. Like, that just doesn't make I, sense to me. There had to be something weird. Jake, I'm glad you brought and up. And there was, in uh, fact. I'm glad you brought up uh, Thanks a Lot and the writing on that track. Because that's it's the... So good. The bridge specifically, uh, which is, um, I'm the one for you because I know all the dirty things you like to do. I'm the mm. fear in your eyes. I'm the fire in your flies. I'm the sound that's buzzing around your head. That, you know, you know what those lyrics, which songwriter those lyrics have the exact same energy as? I feel like you know who I'm thinking of. I feel like I am too, but I'm going to make an ass of myself yeah, if same. I'm wrong. But it's, That's uh, all right. Yeah. It just makes me think of J.C. Lacey. That uh, was it. That was yeah. the thing. And this yeah. kind yes. of record has the same, not consistently, but uh, in many parts has the same sort of energy as Deja. like, yeah, Deja. I'm, I'm t <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So very, very, very similar. And I just, man, I, I, I am just, <sighs> so happy to cover a record like this just because it's so meat and potatoes and like fundamentals and like everything about it that's so good is so obviously good and it's just it, it's just so easy to listen to despite the fact that i feel like dog shit after 53 minutes of this shit but like it's it, I, I i don't know i i can absolutely see why you guys were so like 
damn, I really wish people remembered this band for more than this just this one single, because I'm like, God, man, this is the kind of album that would make me dig into an entire discography. Like, I would be stoked if I didn't know what came after. Yeah, I, in, in, in many ways, maybe it's for the best that this is the only, like, true Third Eye Blind record, um, because, I mean... You don't have to like because of the fact that um kevin cadigan was fired you don't have to necessarily think of the subsequent records as as of the same oeuvre as this you can think of this as this kind of standalone thing and 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 yeah <laughs> i don't know if i even ever have a desire to listen to any of their other the other third eye blind records um this you, feels you so didn't. this feels so um just definitive as a statement uh, mm -hmm. for any band in that time in that era doing that sound it, it makes me think of it's not really the same vibe but it is kind of like from the same scene it makes me think of like the first time i heard clarity by jimmy Eat world I, jimmy Eat world was another one i kept coming back to actually so i i think that's perfectly i fine. think those two records are kind of like banner classics of, of, of this kind of particular sound in this era um and and, and reaching beyond like the conventions or perceptions of of a particular personality or a particular style and just doing something a lot more nuanced and layered and manifold than people expect and i think in a sense that's what brand new did as well um they they took a particular style a particular um they came in a, into a particular scene and they created work that was more dense and and difficult and strange and and varied than, than than they were expected to do, um, and and yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, there's nothing yeah. greater you can say about an album that it's going into my permanent sad boy rotation. Like that's just that's like you've reached the pinnacle of music now. You've done yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Well, I suppose I suppose I should talk about this record. Um, uh, said a man who sounds like he's being condemned to the gallows. Wish I could. <laughs> uh, I I I I don't know what happened. I I've been fine, <laughs> and I like I was not expecting this to be an emotional review at all. Like really, uh, and then you just, we just started doing this, and you guys started talking about the record, and I just it snuck up on me. I mean, um, it would be like if you were if we suddenly were just like, hey, well, we have to talk about Deja. Like that would be me. <laughs> I'd be yeah. like, oh, I've listened to this album ten thousand times and know it front to back. I'll be yeah. Honest. I just then people would start to talk about it and I'd be like, pain, oh, man, pain, so much pain. Yeah, this record just uh, it really hurts. I'm not gonna yeah. lie, uh, and it hurts in the same way that um, you know something like Dejan Tondu or um, any real, really any brand new record does. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so this album was actually released uh, the day before I was born. Um, and actually, if you account for time difference, um, it was technically the same day as I was born. Here that's, anyway. that's some real Magnolia making its American debut the day I was born <laughs> type shit. Holy shit. Yeah, so yeah. this album is as old as me. Um, uh and actually, Jake's kind of spoken about um, the canonical experience with Third Eye Blind in the modern day being like knowing semi-charmed life and then being completely stunned by what the rest of the album it's on is like. Um, but I actually, that was not actually the first um, song from this band that I ever heard. Uh, and it was not the first song from this band. It was not a song I even really particularly had an emotional attachment to until I heard it in the context of this record. Um, but the first song I heard from this band uh, was uh, Losing a Whole Year, and I heard it actually when I was very young um, because the music video, my, my dad would like always have music TV channels on, uh, and he would like video record uh, his favorite music videos basically, and he would make music video compilations from um, by editing like stuff together. Um, it makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? Uh, that my father would be someone who would do something like that. Yeah. Yes, it uh, does. Uh, math, but, uh, the math adds up. But anyway, and, and like dad, dad's not super into alt rock or any of the niches of rock music that this album belongs to or is even related to. But evidently he liked this song. 
um, because uh, he made a music video compilation when I was like four or five years old for me of songs that I seemed to respond to the most when they played on TV or a set that I liked or whatever. Uh, and so this was obviously, this was one of them. Um, and so I watched the music video for this, which incidentally is just fantastic uh, and, and utterly devastating if you haven't seen it. Uh, a really, I have not seen it actually. A really devastating music video. Every, every music video for this album is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, uh, agreed. But yeah, I, I just... What does it have music videos for, just out of curiosity? Uh, I think it's Losing a Whole Year, Semi-Charmed Life, How's It Gonna Be, and there was... Is there one for Jumper? Yeah, yeah. All right, I thought there was. Anyway, um, yeah, so I vividly remember uh, watching the video from Losing a Whole Year when I was there, really young, uh, and that song's kind of always been in my life, and, and you know, I kind of drifted away from music and, and, and rock, alt rock and stuff until I was like a teenager, came back. And again, sort of just never really got around to listening to this record. I didn't really assume this was a band I would enjoy for whatever reason. Um, but this year I did get to come back to losing a whole year uh, at 23. Uh, and, and finally to listen to um, this album as a whole, thanks to Morgan. And yeah, I, it's all great. It's all just as good as that song. And I, 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 I'm, I'm still struggling to believe that I was that 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 that, that is the case, considering how much that song means to me. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a devastating song. It's one of my favorite album openers ever. Uh, as, as it should be. It's fucking amazing. And somehow, somehow for all that it means to me and for all of the nostalgic attachment I have to it. Um, it's not even my favorite on this record. Uh, it's my second favorite, narrowly eclipsed by, funnily enough, the song that immediately follows it, Narcolepsy, uh, which is uh, just one of my favorite songs of all time. Uh, I, I, I love this song more than I love members of my family. <laughs> um, uh, it is. Uh, it, it begins as this uh, beautifully softer ballad, but it eventually blossoms into this full-on rager with some of the most ecstatic and emotive guitar playing in all of alt rock. Uh, the song climaxes uh, early, actually, with this incredible twelve-second guitar solo, um, followed by this my one of maybe may my favorite drum fill in all of music i just it's not necessarily the most technically impressive but just for the context of how it turns up and the effect it has on me following this drum solo it, uh, following this guitar solo rather it just absolutely decimates me the playing on this record uh, uniformly is astounding um and then you go into that refrain in the back half of the song of um how do you like to be alone and drowning over it and over and over again uh and it's just it just it hurts it, it really it's like someone is grabbing my heart and just tightening your fist around it um and i just love the sentiment of um uh i can feel this narcolepsy slide into another nightmare this this notion of like living half asleep um and 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 like the worst shit of your the worst experiences that you have uh like this waking nightmare anyway it's it's uh that that yeah like this notion of a nightmare that you can't wake up from uh yeah just i'm in, i'm incoherent that's how good the song is um it's just i have to shout out as well just how economical it is for a track that is like shy of four minutes it managed to get through some of the most emotive and impressive passages of, of playing uh in in all of 90s rock music uh and it and it does it like like it's the only chance it'll have to do it uh and then to go into it is jarring to go from this into semi charmed life mm -hmm. especially when you kind of forget what that song is um because uh, obviously by the time I got around to this record, I was familiar with that song. Never really paid attention to it. And of course, it's one of those classic examples of a pop song that appears to be one thing uh, and then does a whole like bright sound juxtaposed with dark subject yeah, matter. Meth. 
Um, uh, and it, it just does that so well. Um, it's it's instantly classic. Uh, I really, really want to spend a, a minute talking about Jumper, though. Um, I know I won't be the only person, um, but uh, I would like to say, venture my opinion, that I think Jumper is one of the most empathetic and moving songs about suicide uh, in all of popular music. Um, I'm so thrilled to learn this was a, as a was a reasonably successful single. Um, because a song like this needs to be heard by as many people as possible. Uh, and, and I just want to say, how often do you come across a pop song or any song that's focused around suicide, but with the message not being simply don't do it, or even worse, a purely morose and misery porn portrait of the suicidal pain. But instead of being that, it's uh, a pop song about reaching out to a person in that state and just saying, I understand, and and <laughs> and that it's okay to be feeling the way that you're feeling. Uh, no ifs or buts. How fucking often do you get a pop song that understands that and puts that message out there? So much. Uh, and look, I, I love a lot of miserable music, including a lot of music that is miserable about self-harm and, and suicide. But it is and it, it is always refreshing and, and wonderful to get a song that captures that feeling, but also just communicates a sense of real and unqualified empathy uh, for the people in that situation without trying to like do some kind of first person imagining of like some horrific state of mind. You're just, you're not in that state of mind, but you, you're, so you, you have, know someone who is and you just want to be there for them. Um, and oh, it's such a beautiful song, uh, and and it's so rare to get a song that um, is like that, uh, and it's successful and popular. Like fucking hell, man. Um, yeah, it is a pure compassion, and and for evidence of the extent to which the song has resonated, you only have to go to the YouTube comments for any video of the song. And you get mountains of overwhelming proof. I've bawled my eyes out reading stories that people have posted about how the song literally saved their lives um, and said to them things that even members of their family who loved them just weren't able to say to them because they didn't know how or they didn't understand. Uh, and, and just to be in that situation and have a bunch of people who love you, but no one who knows how to say, I understand, and to hear it from a song. And that's, that's what art is for. Uh, <laughs> fuck, man. Fuck. Uh, Graduate is a punky and raucous banger. Uh, and again, it also has a, like narcolepsy, it has an absolutely soaring solo at the heart of it. Kevin Cadigan just is the fucking MVP of this album and is the heart and soul of it. Um, and, and it's actually uh, about the band's experiences attempting to get signed by a major label. Um, can I graduate, you know, in, in that sense and trying to, uh, and I, I don't really, and I never really like saw it as a song purely about like graduating literally, but to me, it's like a song that I find a lot of poignancy and, and that it captures a state of mind because I obviously am graduated. Um, but to me, it resonates because it captures a state of mind where you're like waiting for the next part of your life to happen. You're waiting, you're in this stasis moment and you're waiting you're, you feel like you've been waiting forever for like the good part and and the part where it all makes sense and the part where you have a drive and clarity and the part where you know what you're doing but you're in this limbo where you've been perennially waiting for that and that's what the song captures is the feeling of being stuck in that mode um and 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 i, I that's what's so beautiful about the song is that it's um so multifaceted and the way that it's written that it can apply to any number of life situations where you're waiting to graduate to the next stage uh, or to be recognized um, in some way for something that you feel like you're doing that's not getting recognized. Um, yeah, uh, how it's going to be, I think, uh, rounds out the incredible six track opening stretch. Uh, I mean, that's not standing great, thanks a lot, which I love, but it's the, particularly the first six tracks to me that are like, all some of the best songs I've ever heard. Um, 
uh, it's a, how it's going to be is this auto harp featuring breakup ballad. It's heartbreaking. It's bittersweet. Uh, it's just utterly gutting. Uh, and again, it's one of the best songs of the 90s, like all the first six of these songs and the, the last two on this record are just unequivocally the best songs of their ilk. Um, uh, uh, I do think that relative um, to this opening six track stretch, the next few songs uh, don't quite have the same level of uh, perfectly instantly canonical classic songwriting. They're a little more slight, but they're still like full of really energetic and fun playing, even a bit of a reverence. Um, yeah, I'm not mess massively hot on, on Burning Man or Good For You, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I also, I, I like, I think London is a bit underrated though. It's a really barnstorming and, and, and really loud and punchy track that, I, that I've grown to enjoy the more time I've spent with this album. Like this is a record where it's like, the deep cuts, uh, and the first time you hear it, the deep cuts, yeah, these deep cuts are pretty good, I guess. They're not like the classic stuff. But then you find yourself weeks later humming a song like London, and um, you're like, okay, shit, yeah, the deep cuts on this record are actually pretty fucking good. Uh, I Want You, I think, is also really underrated. Um, it's a more spacious and reverb-heavy but melodically dynamic ballad with catchy vocal melodies and guitar interplay. Um, uh, the background is is even better. Maybe the most underrated deep cut on this whole album. Um, and then you get to fucking Motorcycle Drive By. And I don't want to like steal all the thunder on this one because I know that this song means a lot to Morgan too. But this is just uh, incredible. Uh, one of the best breakup songs of all time by anyone in any genre ever. Uh, honestly, I feel like listening to it, it has the same emotional energy, even though it sounds different, it has the same emotional energy as My Backwards Walk or Poke by Frightened Rabbit. Frightened Rabbit vibes I've gotten multiple times on this record. Yeah, um, but this song in particular feels like it has the same emotional energy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of being a charged breakup song about coming to terms with the pain of separation from someone who once felt like an actual part of you. Um, I mean, the lyricism here is just, I mean, credit to Stephen Jenkins as a writer, the lyricism here is just ast astounding. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I can't, I'm looking at the lyrics right now and I can't even pick out um, a line to highlight. It's very poetic and it, it's more about capturing the feeling than capturing like the experience or the actions or the narrative. It just gets the feeling of it. Um, and God of Wine is <laughs> just astounding. Again, um, it's, uh, I believe Stephen said that the song was written about um, his relationship with his mother um, and the issues that she's had. Um, uh, there's references to obviously to alcoholism in the title um, and tragedy, and it's just such a hard hitting song. And, and the chorus of the song is just devastating. I can't keep it all together. I know, I know, I know, I know, I can't keep it all together. And the siren's song that is your madness holds a truth I can't erase all alone on your face. Uh, just it should be illegal to write a song this <laughs> devastating. Uh, and, I demand compensation. And it's like from it, Mr. Blind. It's, it's like it's like it's like an assault, considering the fact all that we've been through on this record up to this point to get to this song, um, and end on that just utterly heartbreaking note. Um, yeah. Uh, Every thought that I repent, there's another chip you haven't spent, and you're cashing them all in. Where do we begin to get clean again? Can we get clean again? Um, yeah, fuck, I don't know. I don't even know how to put that into words. Like, I've said enough. No, I mean, like, I think Sersha actually said something earlier that's, like, kind of poignant and that, like, my God, I needed this out in high school. Holy yeah. shit. 
I feel like this would have really like helped me like legitimately. That's yeah. That's the best compliment I can give fucking anything. Yeah, songs yeah, like um, Jumper with because yeah, high school wasn't a fun time for me. Um, as I have mentioned in the last episode, we did. I sort of also did turn to drugs to cope with a lot of things. Um, and I feel like this album would have been something that I really could have used. One thing, I, one more thing I want to say. to people who did not have good high school experience. Yeah, absolutely. One more thing I want to say, uh, a note on sequencing as well. Like when you're trying to help someone who's suicidal, when you're trying to get through to them and just even just to tell them that you understand and that you're concerned for them, um, and that you want to you want to help them. It's a difficult thing to do. Um, people put up defenses, uh, you know, and people want to be alone, and people don't want to drag other people into their shit, and for all sorts of reasons, it's hard. And so, uh, a work of genius on the structuring of this record that makes Jumper even more impactful is that you um, you spend the first three tracks. Um, in the mindset of someone who is kind of like depressed and and at the end of their rope and suicidal and um the the record gets through to you and and empathizes with you by like channeling those feelings and being from the perspective of that person and then you get to jump her and it immediately opens with i wish you would step back from that ledge and it's like you've let your guards down for this album and and now you're and to the point where you're open to actually being communicated with and and like and that is what makes the opening of of jumper so affecting instantly is that you you've been in the perspective of someone who's kind of sliding down to the end of their rope and all of a sudden you're shifting into the perspective of someone who wants to help and the record lets you put the record lets you the record empathizes with you and lets you bring your defenses down so that you can be helped um, in a way that's, and obviously it does it in a way that's really sensitive and not manipulative or anything. Um, and it's just a master stroke. Um, yeah, it's, I don't have a single negative thing to say about this album, but there's just little things like that that I have only really come to appreciate with time. Yeah. He speaks. Yeah, that was a wonderful review, Tyler. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for really, doing that for us. Like, I'm glad that you could sort of attack that with the e emotional depth that someone who's spent a lot of time with this record has, just because that's the one thing that I lack. Mm. But like, now that I have it, I'm very grateful. I mean, yeah, like I said, this, was, this came out basically the day I was born. I'm going to feel an, an intangible attachment to this album until the day that I die. That's, yeah. That's and I'm just glad, because I never would have listened to this fucking thing if Morgan didn't recommend it to me. Like, who, who, who is going to go back and listen to the guys who did a radio hit in the 2000s that everybody remembers for being kind of quirky, you know? Yeah, quite. Um, but speaking of Morgan recommending this record, yeah. it's time to move on to the man himself. Yeah, yeah, everybody, everybody done such a good job of getting at what this is. Um... Uh, somebody mentioned um, wishing they had this album in high school, which is exactly the feeling I got the first time I ever heard it, which was in freshman year of college. Um, as my first and only semester at a university, something I've talked about every now and then, um, was not a good time. Um, yeah, I was, I just, I had read, I think it was Crash Thompson, who was like, like everybody just remembers Semi-Charmed Life, but like that whole self-titled Third Eye Blind, that's amazing. And I was just like, oh, okay. Um, I really like Semi-Charmed Life. Uh, and then I just put on Losing a Whole Year and I was like, oh, son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's. You made the face on the album cover. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, I remember it 
very distinctly. I was I was walking to my first class at college ever. I was walking to the bus to ride up to where it was. And I was just like, this is feels like the the rest of my life is starting today. And it kind of was. Um because that set of like four or five months was in retrospect in retrospect probably the most instrumental point of my entire life thus far um and you know there's only been 21 years of it there's not a whole lot of competition um but yeah just other albums i had during that time a lot were uh, go farther in lightness uh dying star uh you know just things of that ilk uh particularly because i was i could not i drank a lot then and just albums about addiction and trying to be a better person were things that really resonated at that time uh particularly something like Jumper, which Tyler's talked beautifully about. Um, but that's that song in particular resonates with me because there is a point in my life at uh, the university where it was like, I don't know who to talk to about any of this uh, because my friends and I would just be drinking and trying to have a good time. And um, and you know, Jake was three hours away, and uh, my parents were three hours away, and it was I lived with in the same room, like a little, like four by four feet prison cell, uh, with the guy. I didn't know, didn't care for, who smelled terrible. Um, and it, it was, I, I mean, I didn't know what to do about anything. Um, and just the, the fact that uh, some guy put in three words, that being I would understand, it just cuts right through all of that. It's like, you can reach out to somebody because they do care and they do understand. Um, yeah. That, that was, yeah. And then just the, the instrumental bridge in that song is like the, the single most joyous, wonderful thing I've ever heard in my life where Jenkins just lets out that incomprehensible scream and uh, uh, the whole band comes in and it's like, oh, he could, it's like breathing for the first time in months. Uh, It's good stuff. And pretty much every song on this album has a moment like that. Um, it's, It's an album of like really really solid musicians doing things very well in which, uh, but in that consistency is moments of absolute brilliance. Like I think of the, uh, the drum fill F in uh, losing a whole year on the line, on the line about uh, uh, what's this? Uh, I seen you pop that check and it's, and it's like, I, you touched the, the good parts of my brain. You did it. It just, I mean, just small moments like that and even big ones like the the guitar solo and drum fill at the end of Narcolepsy or the guitar solo on Graduate or the, the part towards the end of How's It Gonna Be when it's like you can hear Jenkins and Cadigan who sings backup vocals on that song where it's just the the anymore becomes sort of strained like at the very end there yeah and it just is 
yeah, that's that's that good good. It's good stuff. Um Yeah, there's just not a miss on here. I'm looking at the track list and it's like even the even the stuff that is just less good by default that it's not one of the six best songs ever made is still like yeah, that's 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 probably a highlight on any other album. Um the background is I mean I think we all have somebody that we have carried in the background of our lives for long amounts of time before. And I think that that song gets at that exact feeling and puts words to it in a way that I had never really processed before. And that's a, that's a hell of a thing. Um, I love what Tyler said about uh, God of Wine. Um, I don't have a massive emotional attachment to that song. I think it's amazing, but there are other things that just take priority over it, over it. Um, but what I love so much about motorcycle drive by, which is one of my 10 favorite songs ever, um, is just how purely sensory it is. It, it never ascribes specific details to the situation that it, uh, depicts, but, it's also, you know, exactly what the narrator is feeling, where they are, what they're doing. Um, and the the genius of it being the penultimate track is like, it's unparalleled because it's like that moment on the the cusp of adulthood where it's like we've... It's it's at the end of something notable. It kind of reminds me of the end of Before Midnight, um, where they're just sitting out, oh, watching the sunrise, and it's just it, it's it's the it's the calm after the storm, I guess. It's a good way to say it. Um, but yeah, it's it's poetry. Um, the final verse has always stood out to me. So I go home to the coast. It starts to rain. I paddle out on the water alone. Taste the salt and taste the pain. I'm not thinking of you again. Summer dies and swells rise. The sun goes down in my eyes. See this rolling wave darkly coming to take me home. And I've never been so alone. And I've never been so alive. And it's like, why? how did you just get all of youth down to like what is that one one two three four five six seven, eight, ten, eleven stanzas you just got the feeling of youth and the feeling of youth fading in eleven stanzas and it's like one of the most utilitarian but most deeply emotionally evocative things I've ever like laid eyes or ears on. Um, yeah, and there's every, at least every song on here has at least one moment like that that's on that level. And really what it comes down to is which ones grab you the most. Uh, because I think Thanks A Lot is like a really great track, but the uh, the idea that it was anyone's like favorite or top three on this record was a little baffling to me. And then I just sat and thought about it for two seconds, and I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, because just every song is so specific, but so universal in so many ways for people of our age, of any generation. Like, no wonder it was a hit. Because it's like there's something for everybody here. Because it's like I don't know. It, it allows us to touch the parts of ourselves that we're the least proud of, and sort of acknowledge that someone does understand. 
and you're not a terrible person for thinking it or feeling it. And that's something that literally everyone needs to hear at some point in their lives. Um, which is good because uh, my charmed life was everywhere. Everyone's heard that literally. Um, yeah, it's good. Beautifully said. Yeah, again, that was another great review. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. wow. um, okay, well, let's move to our favorite tracks and ratings then. Jake. I'd love to do that. I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to lie down for about uh, 15 hours. I'm going to lie gonna down lose a whole maybe year. sometime. <laughs> Jake. Uh, my three favorite tracks are uh, Thanks a Lot, Losing a Whole Year, and Narcolepsy. Uh, yeah, really, really maverick mode here, me. Mm -hmm. um, least favorite, uh, just by virtue of I like every other song more, is Burning Man. Good song, mm -hmm. just doesn't hit me the way other ones do. Uh, and I give the album an 8.5. Neat O. Um, Morgan. Uh, my three favorite tracks are. Uh, motorcycle drive by. Uh, how's it going to be in narcolepsy? Um, don't have a least favorite. Ten. Yeah, fair enough, dude. Um, my favorites are probably losing a whole year of sleep, motorcycle drive by, and uh, uh, let's say jumper. I think. But really, it could be any number of records. A uh, song, sorry. If I was to pick a least favorite, I would say probably London. I'm giving the record an eight and a half out of ten. Okay, my, my three favorite tracks are uh, Narcolepsy, Losing a Whole Year, and Murder Cycle Drive By. Uh, my least favorite track is probably Good For You. Uh, and this album is getting a 9.5 from me. Astonishing, um, which gives it a rating of 9.1, which is what we gave to Get to Heaven, White Pony, uh, 14 Autumns. This okay. is correct. Beautiful company right there, man. Damn, mm -hmm. that's good. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I know I know. August gave it a six, so that's like... That he's not it, here. He is not yeah. here. <laughs> it would be realistically, it would be a little less than that, which is still great. Yeah, well, if let's just say if August was to give it a, a six, that would still give it the same rating as uh, the Verve EP dance music, reinventing Axel Rose, Spirit World Field Guide. Yeah, that'll do. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, so next week on our record club, we are going to be covering. Uh, You're gonna be covering Sasha's choice, isn't it? Matt Elliott's yeah. drinking songs, a that's really correct. cheery album that's gonna really brighten oh, the mood. Really kicking off the year with a lot of. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna lie that the week after that, with my recommendation, it's not gonna get any cheerier. What, what is oh, what's your recommendation? Uh, the Meadowlands by the Wrens. It's uh, it's a, um, it's an emo yeah. record. Um, Can't wait. Anyway, yeah, let's talk, talking about drinking songs, uh, that's a record that's been a lot for me for a while. Um, so it'll be nice to go back to it. Yeah, so check out, check that out. If you haven't seen it already, this week we did uh, new release reviews, newish release reviews of Taylor mm -hmm. Swift's Evermore and uh, The Avalanche's We Will Always Love You. Uh, next yeah. week uh, we'll be reviewing Playboy Cardi and presumably another record from December unless something new comes out. So check that out. Uh, let us know in the comments below what you think of Third Eye Blind. Uh, in general, what you think of this album, what you think of your other records if you want, uh, and what you think of our video. And yeah. Uh, Rock in the podcast first unanimous 10 out of 10. <laughs> uh, uh, rock over London, uh, rock on Chicago. Chicago, shapes, flavor you can see.